Lord our God, we want to thank you for allowing us this opportunity to, to talk about what you're doing in Taiwan through Eric and his ministry there. We pray that your presence might guide us in our conversation, that at the end of the day, you will be glorified. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So, Eric, uh, you and I were in seminary together for a number of years at Westminster Theological Seminary. And uh, you've since graduated, as I have, and serving the Lord now. Uh, just tell us a little bit about who you are, how you came to seminary, why you came to seminary, and then we're going to transition into what you're doing now. Okay, well, I first came to Westminster, I think in, it was 2004, yes. Summer Greek, yes. in July. I that. <laughs> yep. And the reason I came there was just a deep conviction that this is a school where the gospel was going to be you know, kind of put in our hearts and the place where we would be preaching faithfully. Um, in college, I had been involved in some ministry on campus mm -hmm. and it had always been on my heart to do missions or to do church planting. And uh, one gentleman in particular really influenced me and convinced me to go to Westminster, California because of the rich tradition of preaching and yeah. um, gentlemen like, you know, Michael Horton, and uh, I had been reading R. Scott Clark's uh, blog a lot, and just, you know, kind of, okay, this is a place I can see myself really uh, living in the community and, and enjoying uh, God's grace and mm -hmm. just learning how to be, become proficient in the scriptures. Yeah, yeah, that's very good. Say, I would say the same thing here. Is that actually, two things. One was the academic excellence that Westminster seminary brings, but also the, the theological profoundness, the theological uh, faithfulness to what scripture teaches, and the Christ-centered nature of everything that is taught there. For me, those things were very attractive. So uh, I was very, I'm glad that I went there, and I'm thankful to God for the opportunity to study at such a prestigious university, uh, seminary. But now, how did Westminster seminary change you? How, how did seminary change you? Uh, during the time that you were there? Well, I mean, after my first year, I was invited to go and teach in some house churches. Mm. And Where? In China. China. Yeah, and during that time, I really saw how practical it was all that we had learned that mm. first year. And that first year, you're just kind of immersed in the whole framework of covenant theology and um, getting into preaching, but really you're just kind of learning uh, how to understand the Bible and how to apply it. And so even though I had just done one year of study, when I went to Asia, I saw that people there really, they had no access to seminaries um, for, the, for the most part. They didn't have a, a great library. They just really had their Bible and they wanted to know how does it fit together. And so Westminster really helped me to um, see how all the pieces of scripture fit together and after that first year I saw okay this is really important yeah. you know it's not just theoretical um, it's not just knowledge but it's also knowledge that is applied into people's lives um, so throughout my time at Westminster I really um, experienced um, God's love for me also you know being involved in church planting mm -hmm. um, I was an intern at a church plant in Temecula, California, and I just saw um, how my mentor, Eric Landry, how he preached faithfully, yeah. how he shepherded the flock, and how he counseled people, and how the gospel was at the center of all of that. So that changed me as well, and just over the years, it took me four years to get through, but <laughs> by my... You finally made it. <laughs> yeah, towards the end of my seminary career, I... I also went to Taiwan and you know I, I did another internship I took a year off from school and mm -hmm. um, just I saw okay there's such a great need for the gospel amongst these people yeah so so many churches I visited um, other than the church where I was the intern were just completely devoid of Christ Center preaching and mm -hmm. every message I heard was really about um, self-fulfillment or schemes for getting uh, building your fortune you know so you know over the over the years I was changed 
as I saw the need and I saw that I was being equipped for that ministry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So talk to us about the church in Taiwan. I mean, what is really happening there as far as the church is concerned? Well, the church there is small relative to other countries in the region. How many Christians would you say in Taiwan? Well, let's 2.7, 2.6% of the 23 million. So, it's a you know, really small number. Yeah. I don't know what what if you do the math on that, about 300,000 <laughs> maybe, but yeah, whatever it is, but it's literally very small in comparison to the US for example. Yeah. Or even Malawi where I'm smaller from. than China, definitely. Small much smaller than North or South Korea. Uh, a little higher than Japan yeah. and Thailand. So it's kind of, you know, in the spectrum, doing better than Japan, but yeah, Japan's yeah. around 1% maybe, yeah. or less. Yeah. Um, but that's still very small. Yeah, but the really, the concerning thing for me was just visiting churches, and you don't sense that the gospel has impacted people at a heart level. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a real sense where um, the gospel... It doesn't cause people to forgive one another. It doesn't mm -hmm. remind people of their need to uh, show grace to others. So grace is not really a concept that's that's part of the churches. It's definitely not part of the culture as a whole. Yeah. It's not a grace-based culture. You know, it's it's very hard for people to forgive. It's not and, do this and live. You know? Yeah. Survival of the fittest. <laughs> so, for me, that was really discouraging because interpersonal relationships are not based at all on grace it's mm. very much performance based yeah. so there's a lot of shame um, that's put on people when they don't perform and that's supposed to motivate them to be yeah. more obedient yes. you know yes. so I mean it sounds like the gospel is really not being faithfully preached in these churches they may talk about Christ they may talk about the Bible but it seems like they, there's something really missing in the lives of the people as they those who go to church and those who don't it seems like there's not much much of a distinction really in terms of their approach to life for, uh, from the Christian standpoint yeah I'd say there's definitely they try to distinguish themselves the, the Christians by their um, obedience but it's more of just a focus on external obedience rather than real heart change heart, yeah. and I can't speak for all Taiwanese churches because there's many I haven't visited, yeah. but in general, yeah, there, there's definitely more of a focus on the external. Uh, you know, when you become a Christian, you know, you go. It's more about going to Bible study, going to church on Sunday. Um, you know, kind of checking things off your list of you things you're not going to do. Things, yeah, you do these things, but you don't get to the heart of like motivations. And, like what Christ has done for us. Yeah. Hmm. And now, Christ isn't the motivation for what you do. Yeah. It's more like, well, it's often it's driven by a sense of like shame, like okay, this will make me look good if I do this. Yeah, or if you don't do if it, I don't you, do you it, will make shame me your yeah. parents or your fellow brothers and sisters mm -hmm. or or like Christ did all this for you, what are you going to do for him? I see. You know, so more guilt driven, really. Yeah. Not gospel uh, driven. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we need to pray that God will change that and, and that God may also send faithful, God centered, Christ centered preachers to Taiwan like you and, and others. Now, you have a vision for Taiwan, if I may say. Uh, do you want to share with us about that? Like, what's your short term and long term? vision for for Taiwan well in the short term um, my vision is to get as proficient as I can in, in the language yes. so that I'm most able to have an impact in the community can you speak what is it Mandarin or Cantonese what Mandarin is? yeah okay can you can you just give us a test of <laughs> what it sounds like say well, something what do you want me to say God loves you or whatever something like that you can say Jesus loves you. Yes. Yesu Aini. Alright. <laughs> Yesu Aini. <laughs> Alright. Yeah, so that's your short term vision. You said uh, to learn the language and become proficient in that. Yeah, and Anything while else? we're doing that, we want to do um, 
similar to Reformed University Fellowship, RUF, in yeah. America. Okay. Campus ministry where you're engaging people with the gospel weekly at a, like a weekly meeting, but also in your home and Bible studies, discipleship one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. And uh, while we're there, we'll be connected with a, a, a like-minded church. Yes. So that if we do share the gospel with students and they want to get baptized, you know, they can be involved into the church mm -hmm. in the short term mm -hmm. before we actually launch our own church. Yeah. But I don't want to launch until we've, you know, I feel comfortable enough to, to preach and teach in, in, the, in, the in the language. In the language. Yeah. yeah. So it, 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 it will be a couple of years off, and that's okay, but it's usually standard for most missionaries, two years of full-time language study. Yeah. But I don't want to limit myself during those two years and just do language study because I really feel a burden for the students. Yeah. And I'm going to be on campus anyways taking classes. Yeah. So I might as well, you know, use that as a launching place for our ministry. Mm -hmm. And we'll see what the Lord does during those two years. Um, hopefully we'll see some fruit mm -hmm. and some conversions and some opportunities to make disciples and really teach them the faith, yes. you know, that was once and for all delivered to the saints. Amen. And after that, we want to work alongside with a Taiwanese pastor, hopefully someone who's similar in their philosophy of ministry, someone who wants to do evangelism, mm -hmm. someone who's committed not just to, you know, um, the ministry on Sunday, but also cares about, you know, the lost and wants to reach them and, and wants to see the church grow organically, not just through transfer of membership from other churches. Mm -hmm. So someone who has that kind of entrepreneurial, church planning, uh, visionary spirit, yeah. who's also committed to the doctrines of grace, yes. and our ecclesiology, our doctrine of the church, mm -hmm. someone who's uh, sound in their doctrine, but also very evangelistic. Mm -hmm. If we can find that kind of partnership, it would be wonderful, and just you know, eventually, uh, after starting several Bible studies, launch a worship service on a Sunday. Well, we'll be praying that the Lord provides just the right person yeah. for that. You know, John 1 verse 6, I think. Those are mine sent from God. His name was John. And we'll be praying that God will send someone to you uh, from the Taiwanese population, somebody who can work hand in hand with you to establish the gospel ministry there for the cause of Christ. I'm, I'm really excited to see a fellow seminary friend uh, out into the world proclaiming the gospel because the need is great yeah. around the world, uh, not only in North America or in Africa, but in Asia and in other parts of the world. The need for faithful, God-centered, Christ-centered gospel preachers is great. The harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, as Christ said. So we pray, but also... It's great when you can go actually and do yeah. the work and see what God can do through, you know, weak people like us. Uh, what would you say to our fellow seminary friends that have graduated, perhaps are not sure if they should get into the ministry or go to, go on the mission field? And also, what would you say to students who are currently studying, whether it's at Westminster Seminary or another seminary, regarding their calling as gospel preachers? Well, I mean, first of all, you have to find the ministry that fits your gifts and fits your passions. And if you're thinking about being a missionary, you know, there's so many places that are ne that have needs. Mm -hmm. When you think about so many countries that have a very small percentage of Christians, even less than Taiwan, and that there's no one who's really going to those countries. and so anywhere you go, there's going to be a need for gospel-centered preaching and for Christ-centered ministry. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the need, but it's also where do you feel like God has given you a burden? Mm -hmm. where, do you, where do you sense that, okay, my personality, my gifting fits with the need in that community? Mm -hmm. And that could be locally or it could be, you know, taking a pulpit somewhere. And it's really hard to say... Um, it's more of a case-by-case -case basis, you know, your individual person counseling them to see, okay, where do you want to go? Where do you feel called? Mm -hmm. what, would you, what would you like to be in five years in terms of ministry? And I think if you can do something else, you know, if you, 
if you don't feel like you have to be a missionary, like you would feel content just uh, staying locally, then that's that's wonderful. Yeah. You know, not everyone is called to foreign missionary work, and not everyone is called to the ministry. But whatever your calling is, you know, be sure that you're doing it in a way that honors God mm -hmm. and is committed to doing things biblically, and in a way where you feel like your passions and your uh, calling is being fulfilled, you know, in and through your ministry. Mm -hmm. So for me, I mean, when I look at Taiwan, it's a place where I feel comfortable among the people. It's a place where I know the need is great. It's a place where I can connect with people easily. And so, you know, th those are the, some of the things that I think about when I think about ministry and mm -hmm. calling. And I look at what God's doing in Asia and what he, ha he has been doing and what he will do. And it's just uh, very exciting mm -hmm. yeah, to see that. Well, can you give us just some, maybe three or four ways that people can support you? Um, what are, what are, what are some of the things that you consider to be real needs for you and your ministry? And how could people help? Well, our biggest need in Taiwan is definitely for what I already mentioned, is for other faithful ministers, especially from Taiwan. They may have grown up in the States, but if they can speak the language, if they understand the culture, um, if they, especially if they've been theologically trained already, it would be wonderful. But, you know, faithful men that we can uh, entrust the Word of God to, that we know will be faithful over the long term to preach, to teach, to, to do evangelism, and to multiply, you know, to make disciples. And so that is something that's really been lacking, mm -hmm. something that we've been praying for for years. Um, because when you have some people who you're excited about, and you know, maybe this is a potential coworker, and then they end up not pursuing the ministry, it can be kind of disheartening. Mm -hmm. And there's various reasons why that happens, but uh, we're really hopeful that the right person will come around, but definitely that's a prayer need, because mm -hmm. God um, has to really raise that person up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, our other big thing is where we're moving is, I'd say there's very few Christians in that community, and yet it's a very densely populated area. Um, thousands and thousands of people just living really right on top of one another and yet only one in uh, less than a hundred probably knows Jesus and even those who really know Jesus their faith may not as, be as mature mm -hmm. so it can be a, a discouraging place you feel kind of a sense of spiritual darkness mm -hmm. um, when you go there and there's just temples everywhere and constant offerings being made to local deities so that kind of thing can can wear on you so pray for us that we wouldn't lose heart mm -hmm. that we would be bold and um, that whatever you know spiritual forces are at work there um, that God would protect us you mm -hmm. know from from Satan and from attacks spiritual attacks mm -hmm. whether it's our family or just um, relationship with with others, that there would be unity, that mm. there would be uh, likeness of mind and calling. Mm. So that's a, an, another thing we really ask for prayer. Um, up to this point, God has really provided for us in so many ways, so we're really confident that He will continue to provide. Mm. We've seen how faithful He's been. Um, for the past 10 months, we've been doing support raising, and we've seen how God has just raised up people from all sorts of backgrounds and ways we never expected, you know, to support our ministry. Wonderful. So that we can live on the field and and. Just... You've raised about what ninety five percent of your support by now. Yeah. And so. We still need five percent. We're so. yeah. We're at the last five percent, and we're continuing to visiting churches and correspond with people. So we're we're very hopeful that we'll be fully supported by the end of the month. Wonderful. So, yeah. Well, we'll pray with you for that. I trust God is able to, to provide. You know, he, he owns the cattle in a thousand hills, silver and gold belong to him. Yeah. Um, so that's wonderful. Um, I want to ask you a personal question, really, uh, just related to what we've been talking about, but more at a more personal level. 
What does Christ mean to you? Well, at a personal level, you know, Christ is obviously my Lord. He is my Savior. He is the reason for the hope that I have. Without Christ, you know, I can't imagine living in this world because Christ is the source of my righteousness. Mm -hmm. And He is the one who not only died for me, but He lived for me and, and triumphed over death. So without Christ, if Christ was not raised, you know, I'd be pretty much living a, a very nihilistic life. Yeah. And I can't imagine the worldview without Christ as yeah. Lord. And so every day I look to Christ for my hope. I look to Christ for my hope when I'm discouraged and when I'm struggling with sin. I look to Christ mm -hmm. as my mediator, as the one who intercedes for me. I looked for him as my king who's triumphing over all of my enemies and his enemies and just yes. ruling, you know. And God has been so faithful throughout history to provide his son freely and to give him up for me personally mm. so that I can know him, that I can be reconciled to him, that I can have confidence before him, I can worship him as we did today, mm. you know, with such great sense of, of his presence through the spirit. So it's really hard. It's like such a big question to imagine life without Christ. Cause ever since I knew Christ, I couldn't imagine a day not knowing Christ, mm. you know. You just raised a question in my mind. You wanna, maybe you may want to share with us. How did you come to know Christ? How did you come to saving faith? Can you share that story with us? Yeah, this was in uh, high school. I went to a prep school in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And at that time I was just kind of just going through the motions and studying and playing sports. I didn't really have much of a sense of the eternal or I was very much just interested in my own things and pursuing my own dreams. But I had a really good friend who went to a local reformed Presbyterian church and this church actually was really evangelistic also and they he invited me to these outreach events they would have every Thursday and it was all for high school students. Mm. So he invited me and I, I went because it was fun and there were skits yes. and the youth pastor was very dynamic and mm -hmm. I, I didn't really listen much to the messages in the beginning, but I went be for social reasons, you know, but eventually at the, uh, by the end of the, end of the year, the end of the school year, I joined this summer camp and it was kind of the sim similar type of thing with a lot of skits and fun time. Yes. But at night they had like a more of a serious time where the pastor would get up and preach from the Bible. And there was a time of singing songs. So I had never like cracked open a Bible in my entire life. Wow. I, I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know anything about Jesus. Even though I'd grown up, you know, attending church here and there maybe on Christmas and Easter. But yeah, the, the pastor just faithfully laid out the gospel and our need for Christ, our sin, and and why God's wrath uh, is against us apart from Christ. Mm -hmm. And I just felt very convicted. And I think I always had a kind of a sensitive conscience, but hearing it from the scriptures, through, the, through God's working through the Spirit, um, by the end of the week I was you know, just pretty much convinced that this is the truth mm. and that I had to believe it. Yeah. Um, it took me a little while to, to eventually get baptized um, because I didn't understand fully the implications of, of everything that I was learning. Mm. But the church faithfully discipled me over the years and it was, uh, it was such a blessing. Mm. Wonderful. That's very encouraging, yeah. <laughs> especially for preachers and teachers of God's Word that, you know, Faith truly comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. And when the word is faithfully preached, Christ is speaking, and through that he calls people to himself, opens their eyes to see his glory and his majesty and his saving grace. That's wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, just before we wind up here, you faithfully preached the word of God uh, for us this morning. It was great to have you in our worship service, and I thank God that uh, for the first time you could come and 
uh, not only visit me and my wife and our children for these days with your wife, Annie, but also you could come and you know worship with us and join us in the in the praising our God. And uh, you preach from Acts 13 and how you know Paul and Barnabas were sent by the Holy Spirit mm. to go and serve Him. Uh, I would like to just ask you uh, before we wind up at the very end to pray for us uh, and pray specifically for our congregation but also for anybody who may be watching this this video that God by His Spirit might work in their hearts and perhaps send them out to do His work whatever that might be wherever that might be and that God will also give them corresponding grace to respond in faith and obedience to His call upon their lives even as Paul and Barnabas did. But uh, before you pray for us, is there anything you want to share just as a last word to, to me and to others that might be watching this video? Well, I mean, uh, that particular passage was so encouraging for me because I saw how God is with us through every step. I mean, you don't see it necessarily in Acts 13, but you see in the other chapters of Acts how God's hand was upon Saul to convert him, mm -hmm. and Christ met him, you know, on the road to Damascus and convicted him, but then he taught him and trained him and prepared him, mm -hmm. and uh, I've seen that so much in my own life, how from the time I converted in high school, you know, to God's faithfulness to me in college, sending me to a place where the gospel was preached faithfully from a a Presbyterian minister on campus and joining a, a local OPC uh, Orthodox Presbyterian Church congregation and just everywhere I went I seemed to find that God was faithful and mm -hmm. not only in doctrine but in fellowship and and uh, providing for all of my needs uh, whenever I took mission trips so I, I just see how the Spirit is leading and guiding us as his people mm -hmm. providing so richly for us in so many ways that we don't even acknowledge often but you know no matter how difficult things get and sometimes you do struggle and doubt you know am I, am I in the right place but you know that God is faithful and that he's he will provide and he will take care of his people mm -hmm. and when we're committed to his word and sharing his word you know we will be uh, experience his pleasure and the blessing that come with that Amen. as well so Amen. it's really Amen. it's really uh, we're just getting started in Taiwan and you know our public ministry but I'm so confident now seeing all that God has done already in in me and just in my life and mm -hmm. in the lives of so many people around me that that he will surely continue to work Amen. no matter where we go yeah yeah that's great well Eric, um, my wife and I, Angela and myself and our kids, Kara and Fletcher Jr., CJ mm -hmm. we call him. We've really enjoyed having you and Annie here over these few days. Thank and, you. And uh, it's been a blessing. Please come back and uh, keep us posted on what God is doing through you and through others in Taiwan. And so, so that we can continue to pray for you. But now it's your turn to pray for us and uh, ask God's blessing upon you what he's doing here also in our midst. Let's pray. Our faithful and great God, we thank you that you have called us out of the darkness. We all once walked in the futility of our sins and just in the darkness of our minds and hearts, and yet you were merciful to us. You lavished your grace upon us, and you called us to be your people, to be a people that are holy and set apart for your purposes. We thank you for the Spirit and how the Spirit has been working to bring the gospel to the nations and has been sending out missionaries uh, since the days of Acts um, and just how that encourages us to see how everywhere they went, people were open to hear your word. And though they were persecuted often, they realized that it was through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. I just pray that you would encourage any of those who are here listening or who watch this video that are 
thinking about their calling that they would see that you are faithful, that you are caring, that you are loving, that you as a Heavenly Father provide for all of our needs, even the ones that we don't acknowledge. We know that you are uh, lovingly and um, just perfectly orchestrating all things for our good and for the ministry that you have called us to, whether we're called to be um, minister to our own families or minister to our co-workers or minister to uh, a lost world. We just pray that we would always have great hope in Christ and that his, his word would dwell in us richly, that it would flow from our mouths freely and boldly and that we would just know when to speak and give us the words to speak and just help us to have confidence that you are doing such a great work and that you will be uh, faithful to your promises and that you will continue to grow your kingdom and that your kingdom will come one day. We long for that day and we pray that you would use us even though we are weak, even though we are fallen uh, servants, use us even in our weaknesses to proclaim the excellencies of you, our great King. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. 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 Thanks, brother. Thanks a lot. God bless uh, you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you.